No, we went to China, but I, you know, I wanted to eat scorpions and all that stuff, but I couldn't do it. I was very disappointed with myself. I was, you know, Indonesia, I tried snake blood in 1992. And but how I was, was that? <laughs> <laughs> it was great. It was great. It was a big party that they prepared for us. And uh, it was what, a lot of food. What does it taste like? No, it tastes with, uh, because they mix the, the, the snake blood with the uh, liquor. Okay. Uh, to, you know, so it's Because alcoholic. the blood is a little... It's not so liquid, you know, it's like... It's thick, yeah. So, yeah, there's a lady, there was a lady there in this party they made for us with a lot of uh, live snakes on, the, on, a, on, a, on a big trash sack or uh -huh. something like that, you know, bag. And she was there, poof, because snake alive. <laughs> <laughs> Cut the head, the head on the floor, <laughs> and then she put the, the skin and put, you know, all the snake blood yeah. in, a, in a cup. And then she put that liquor and, and, and people were drinking. I mean, I was there in, Slo in Indonesia in 1992. I mean, I, I had to do that, you know. <laughs> and I did it. It was great. I mean, I had a lot of nightmares, but that was it. <laughs> a lot of nightmares. <laughs> was no hallucinological any effect, you know. But it was great. It's a story that can, I, can, I can tell for my, to my sons and grandsons, you know. Who knows? And uh, it's great, you know, to, to have this uh, uh, privilege, you know, to... And in Brazil, we don't drink snake blood, but it doesn't mean that the fucking Indonesians are crazy, you know? It's, it's their culture. I, I, I was there to learn, you know, and, and to see why th they do it. And, and even if I don't understand why they're doing it, it doesn't matter, you know? I have to respect that because it's their culture. We, are, uh, we were invited to be there, you know? And uh, that's the beauty, you know, to learn and not to be afraid of it, you know? I think that's the same approach we we have with our music. We we don't we're not scared of of trying new things, you know, bring violins or Derek using more of their melodic voice, you know, that kind of stuff. Because uh, we do that with um, with a lot of um, uh, property, you know, because we wanted to to do something different for us. And uh, and like I said, the privilege to travel, we always you know, in learning new things, meeting new people, new bands, and new music, and that's keep our mind always fresh, you know. So an invitation, an invitation to play somewhere, you also see it as an invitation to discover a new culture. Yeah, like we went to Cuba in 2008, 2009, practically without a, a fee, you know. They pay our tickets and a little structure to, to be there and our accommodations and food and stuff, but uh, we play basically for free, you know, because for us was important for our cultural uh, baggage to, to go there, you know, Fidel Castro was still alive, although he was not in power anymore, you know, but historically, you know, we went there before the Rolling Stones, you know, um, we played for 60,000 people, it was insane, it was the first heavy metal band from outside Cuba that played in Cuba, you know, uh, a free show in the Malecon was, was insane. And, you know, it's not about the money all the time, you know, we didn't make any money, but the experience we had that, you know, the people we met and, and the possibilities that a visit to Cuba gave to Sepultura, there's no price for that, you know. My wife came with me, you know, we could take our, uh, you know, uh, our closest uh, partners to, to be with us there and to, to experience that with us, you know. Um, so it's great we have this kind of opportunities, you know, to really... Um, make our possibilities and options to write uh, wider, you know, and better. And how does this uh, traveling or does this fact that you meet so many new cultures, is this reflected into your music? If so, Definitely. how? Everything. Can, can you give an example? No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> it's just being what we are, you know, ev everything is an influence. Maybe this interview could be a, a musical idea, you know. And I love that. I, I, I don't want to, I, I kind of force myself not to listen to men too much music. You know, I'm not a hunter of music. Oh, what's going on new and stuff. You know, I, I, I let the music come because I play with so many different bands besides Sepultura. Also the bands that we tour together, festivals that we do, you know, opening local acts that are coming. I have a radio show with my son as well in Sao Paulo, which I receive a lot of especially Brazilian metal and stuff, you know. So um, anything helps, any book, any restaurant that you go, a trip, uh, a plane, <laughs> anything, you know. So we, we keep our minds open and, uh, and Machine Messiah was built around that, you know. 
that experience of traveling and talking to people and and seeing how the phones and smartphones are you know taking over and stuff so good okay now that you were just saying that uh, all these these experiences help in creating your music uh, is there a specific moment when you sit down okay I'm gonna write a few new songs or a new song or it just happens along the way both um, I mean to write that's why I say we're not enemies of technology because I use my smartphone a lot <laughs> uh, because it nowadays is so easy you know to to keep any idea uh, written or if you listen I don't know something on the radio in a train station you'll go there and record you know or or a guitar line even if I don't I have a guitar in my hand you know you do with your mouth and stuff just to keep the ideas you know and um, and any melody can be developed in in any circumstance you know it can be heavy it can be acoustic it can be, be an orchestra it can be a cappella you know it can be anything you know so the most important thing is to keep that uh, rhythm melody connection you know so we can uh, work later uh, in that sense i work that all the time you know i have a lot of stuff here that depends on you know for, for instance at the beginning of 2016 we stopped the tour and stuff and in february we stopped everything okay now we're going to focus only on machine messiah we're going to write a new album but we didn't start from scratch from zero we already have a lot of riffs I have some demos that I work at home with drum machine. Eloy also worked some uh, drum loops and parts that he sent. So you know, so we has, uh, so we had something where to start from, you know. And the rest is just like developing on practice room. Everybody playing, recording, going home, listening, putting on my Pro Tools, and you know, chopping here and there, editing and stuff. Go back to practice and you know, try out the new stuff. And that's how we build everything, you know. Right. And still talking about the, the, the last record as a listener again. So it feels to me that it has more like room to breathe in comparison to the previous record, yeah. The Mediator, which is more gloomy. It's a totally different album, yeah. Uh, what happened along the way? Was there a, spe a specific situation that you were like, okay, so maybe we should try, you know, like to, to something different here. We should change a well, lot. I mean, uh, the mediator it's it's Ross Robinson you know I think the producer is the it is the guy who in the end we called a guy like him to work with us because we want his characteristic his input and his energy you know and Ross is a very spiritual guy you know he he loves mistakes and stuff you know he wants us to work at the limit you know like you know when we can take any more you know and um, especially with singers and stuff, he's very brutal with that in a good sense, you know. I mean, you can ask any singer who worked with Ross Robin and you say like it's one singer before and another singer after working with him, you know, it's very special. And um, even the work that Derek did on Machine Messiah, there's a lot to do with the work we did with Ross, you know, for instance, on the, the previous album. Right. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, and Mediator, is, it's a very dark album, it's a very... Uh, noisy, you know. Ross mm -hmm. also likes a lot of effects. He uses a lot of effects on the vocals and stuff. You know, it is an album that we wanted to do with him uh, because of this. You know, to explore that whatever that um, uh, how can I put it um, spont spontaneous spontaneous spontaneity 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 yeah. That's the word, I guess. <laughs> to be spontaneous. <laughs> to be spontaneous, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and not that Jens Bogren is, uh, uh, it is like that as well. He's a producer, very artistic and stuff. But it's a very different producer, you know, more keen to details. He's a, a more a clean guy in that sense, you know, separating more the guitars with the drums and bass, you know. Technical. Uh, Technical, yeah, and uh, that's why we chose to, to work with different producer, you know, to have that kind of uh, challenge or ability. And we went to Sweden. Uh, it's been since Chaos AD, we didn't record in Europe, you know, 94, 93, 94, which we did the album in Wales, in the UK. And now we're, we went back to Europe, which was perfect, you know, May in Sweden was a perfect weather. 
Jens has a, a, a very nice setup. He has his house here and his studio just by the side, you know, in Orebro. It's a small town in Sweden. And uh, we spend our time there really focused 100%. You know, I could work every detail on the solos. Derek could work his vocals, Paolo, Paolo his bass. Eloy already did the drums. In, uh, we did the drums in Stockholm. And, uh, and then we went to Orebro to finish the album. And um, yeah, every album has its history. You know, we, we don't try to really to to follow one album to each other and because we tour a lot, you know. On Machine Messiah also, we, uh, we are on the second year of touring, uh, expecting uh, it to be another two years of touring, you know. So three years is a long time for us really to, to change and to, you know, develop the songs better and stuff. And, and who knows what the next album will be, you know. We could go to Jens Bogren again. It would be great to work with him again. But we never know, uh, you know, we have a few ideas here and there already, but not a real concept, you know, for, for the next album. We'll, we'll take a while still. We're still very much on Machine Messiah, you know. So basically what you are saying is that uh, the producer and the context in which the record is made is going to influence a lot the final product. Definitely. The producer is the fifth and member of the band, for sure. He's, I mean, and we it are has, four members, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it has been like this uh, in, in, in all Sepultura's yes, records? Yes, yes. So you do give a lot of room to the producer? Yeah, I mean, all the, all the artists do. I mean, there's no, no other reason to have a producer if you don't do that, you know? There's no way uh, uh, a producer will be comfortable to give any suggestions and to change things and say, oh, this is right, this is wrong, and uh, to really to push... Uh, the, the musician at the time of performance, you know, at the highest level, you know, that's the hardest part, you know, really to, to, to put on the album something that is going to stay there forever, you know, we're going to deal with that since we die, <laughs> it's going to be forever there, you know, and uh, so that's the most important thing, you know, momentum that you're there, why you're doing what you're doing there, you know, so the producer is a little bit of everything, you know, of course, the, the, the technical part, you know, uh, arrangement that he he can say this is great this is not but we do together he's not the 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 detector the producer is not a guy who comes in to change everything you know he comes and we work together so he can make sure oh, this is not good why it's not good ah because this this that ah, maybe it'll make sense so let's try this you know it's an open game you know inside mm -hmm. the studio so yes. when we finally decided on a producer we know we're gonna give room 100 percent for him to to be himself, you know, otherwise it would be stupid to pay some money for a guy who's going to be there just to, to put his name on the album, you know. And how, now th this question is going to be, it's pretty much because I am Brazilian <laughs> and uh, you just mentioned that Machine Messiah was the first record that you produced in Europe, that you recorded in Europe uh, in, in, in a long period. Yeah. What's the difference between recording here and recording in Sao Paulo or in, in Brazil? Um, everything, I think. Uh, in Sao Paulo, we are in our hometown, you know. Uh, we go home to sleep and um, we have the cultural effects like football and, you know, friends and stuff like that. And uh, boteco da cerveja, <laughs> the, the corner, <laughs> you know, the beer. So we have temptations like that. <laughs> Um, and it's, you know, you have the idea, oh, you're home, it's going to be good because you're near your family and stuff, but it's totally the opposite. I don't see my family when I'm recording an album because I, I live very early and I arrive very late, you know, and sleep very little and then next day in the morning in the studio. And I don't see my kids going to school and don't see my wife say, hey, bye, hi, bye, hi. <laughs> and in that sense, it's a little more tiring, you know, because... Uh, you're not really 100% there, you know. You're still a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. at home. Which is, for, for, for a recording process, is not that good, you know. So when we go to Sweden, for instance, we stay in Orebro, it's a small town in Sweden. Dude, there's nobody there. It's just us, basically, you know. So there's nothing in our mind besides the album. So we spend a month there doing that you know so we discuss every little detail we change things you know the, the lead is not right okay we try tomorrow so i go there and practice try different stuff you know really focus i sleep in the studio i wake up i'm already there you know working and stuff you know so 
in that sense, it's much better for focusing and, and concentration, you know. Um, but besides that, it's just like the studio and the equipment you have inside, you know. Sometimes you don't even remember when you're at because you're there in the studio like, fucking, oh, we're, you know, five hours already. <laughs> it's like, you know, you lose track of time, which is great, you know. But um, I think it's a little better when we take everything and now we're here and we're going to do this, you know. Stay focused. Yeah. D did, you, did you miss home when you were in Sweden? I miss home, yeah, all the time, of course. But um, when I'm home, I miss the tour as well. <laughs> it's like yeah. my wife says, like, two weeks, no shows. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, you get in a bad mood and stuff. You get, you know, it's like a, it is a rhythm that we, we are very accustomed to. And uh, so it's a good balance, you know, not too much road, not too much home. <laughs> it's like yeah. A, it, it, it is what, what we are, you know, it's our life and how, that's how I built my family, you know, with my yes. music and touring and doing the stuff. Right. On that note, then I will. Thank you very much for your time. Thank Andreas. you. That was very nice. Valeu. Thank you. Valeu.